Thank you, Todd. I appreciate you inviting me to this event uh, today. I am joining you from Los Angeles. As Todd said, my name is Salika Josiah Talbot. Um, I'm honored to speak on a topic that impacts my daily work, but I think impacts us all. The subject of artificial intelligence and how companies and individuals can work together to bring about diversity of thought, new approaches and strategies and making sure that a broader segment of humanity is considered when we are developing technology. Little history, um, it's been widely stated that artificial intelligence um, began somewhere in the 1950s in an effort to solve complex mathematical problems and create thinking machines. Uh, we had talked initially, I think, as an industry about two approaches to artificial intelligence as using formal rules to manipulate symbols, um, a more logic-based approach, not at all based on any biology. And then the second approach, sort of the true nut of artificial intelligence, um, took its leanings from how the brain works, right? Trying to simulate uh, humanity um, in order to solve certain problems, or at least we hope so. In the early days, things moved a little slowly. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount of funding back then. And, um, and in the early days, it was difficult for the industry to um, sometimes be taken seriously. But as we think about it today, boy, oh boy, has artificial intelligence come a very, very long way. Uh, today, it seems like you can't do anything without artificial intelligence being somehow integrally a part of it. It's a natural part of our existence in places and spaces where some people wouldn't even anticipate or expect it. And with each new leap of artificial intelligence, we're in some ways altering the state of humanity so that how we develop it, how we train it, and how we implement it, it is critical for society at large. If you've ever played a video game, you know that it's fertile ground for artificial intelligence. The world of video gaming and AI is integrally entwined. But have you thought about music? Artificial intelligence is now powering computer systems so that we're producing all kinds of music from jazz and classical to, to modern day music. Uh, what about the arts? Artificial intelligence is now creating paintings. Um, and although they say you, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, um, artificial intelligence is creating, some might say, some masterpieces. What about plain old detective work? I used to work for the Motor Vehicle Commission and in Motor Vehicle Commissions and in law enforcement around the country, facial recognition powered by artificial intelligence is a standard part of day-to-day -day businesses and practices. Healthcare, whether it's enhancing surgery or shortening triage times, we even had virtual nurses during the pandemic assisting people uh, from providing medicine to intaking of symptoms. For me, as I said, I'm a transportation person. Transportation is mobility and mobility is freedom. The use of artificial intelligence in new mobility is really defining how our cities and communities look in the future. The role that AI is playing when it comes to sustainable cities and smart cities almost seems paramount to anything else. I've talked to urban planners who are using uh, SimCities artificial intelligence as a roadmap on how to plan for less congestion and more efficient cities. It's not just the game, right? If you look at Singapore, where urban planners are heavily relying on the use of artificial intelligence 
to optimize public transportation in their cities, monitoring issues of emissions and air quality to managing traffic congestion and better land use. It sounds really good and incredibly promising, but in almost all of the spaces that I've just mentioned, where artificial intelligence has either a piece or a part of that industry or is substantially the backbone of that industry, negatives can occur as well. You could have dire consequences and in some cases, really harming humanity. It's not all roses. Now, I just wanna back up for a second. I'm not one of those people who believes that robots are gonna take over the world, right? They're gonna control us, uh, either put us in indentured servitude or kill us and rule the world. That's, that's not my thinking. But I do believe that there are insidious ways that artificial intelligence can be used that are harmful to community and especially those who are marginalized or economically disadvantaged. We can certainly see cases where AI is uh, producing automation and replacing human beings. In some instances, again, it's not so bad. Uh, take the delivery robot, for instance. As we see company after company roll out, roll out their sidewalk delivery bots or their roadway delivery devices, some have pushed back to say, you're replacing the delivery driver. I don't think pushback is necessary. If you're making $15 an hour as a delivery driver, especially in a place like Los Angeles, I can assure you, you can't own or rent a home, own a vehicle, feed and clothe your family and provide the basic needs of life. That $15 an hour delivery job won't do that. So let the robots deliver the goods that we need because it doesn't sustain us as people. I'm passionate about the eventuality of autonomous vehicles on the road. But the public shouldn't be guinea pigs. We have an obligation to be honest about the level of autonomy that vehicles have. We don't have to claim that something is fully autonomous driving when it's only at level two. Level two is still helpful enough to prevent crashes and save lives. There are other areas of labor that we need to be careful about. Where we're not making the human expendable for the sake of artificial intelligence when there's a benefit to having the human there. Sure, it may be faster uh, to triage someone with a robot than a real person, but that human touch, it provides a specific comfort that no robot can. Perhaps we can concentrate on artificial intelligence in spaces that speed diagnoses and cures without removing the ability for bedside human care. We see the rise of artificial intelligence in social media, on Twitter and Instagram. And I'll tell you, I see artificial intelligence coming for me on LinkedIn. It may seem innocuous when someone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, but if it's a deep fake profile for the purposes of creating the appearance of connection with people or persons who I should not be connected with, it could be damaging to my personal reputation. And artificial intelligence is powering that kind of activity. What of course is troubling to many of us is that artificial intelligence very often has bias built in because the humans who are training and developing this artificial intelligence have, as humans do, their own internal biases. Now we've built them into our processes and our algorithms, and they have the potential to harm people in their lives. Often the developers and those who are working in artificial intelligence are primarily male, who come from 
homogeneous communities, monolithic racial demographs, um, high socioeconomic areas, people who don't suffer from disabilities. This homogeneous population may not be the best group to solve for the issues that affect the rest of us. And it's not because they don't care. I dismiss that notion. I think it's because it's not their lived experience. And therefore, when they are developing and preparing the artificial intelligence for circumstances that include people other than themselves, they don't always get it right. I'll give you an instance. Not life or death, but something that we all can sort of relate to or understand. I will admit, I'll keep it between us, I will admit to being one of those people who used to play those Facebook games where you press the button and it can guess your age or you press a link and it'll tell you uh, what famous person you look like. So I got to say, I'm not quite mad at artificial intelligence and Facebook because when I do that age thing, whoa, I get a result I like. I'm going to be 55 this year, but according to Facebook, I'm only 39. It's a circumstance where nobody's going to be angry at artificial intelligence. But I've also clicked those links where they send you a photo of a famous person who they suggest you look like. In each and every occasion where I've clicked that link, the person that I'm compared to is always a Caucasian person. Not because I look like them, but because the algorithms don't account for dark-skinned women like me. And therefore, there's no one to compare me to. Now, there are millions of people of color around the world. And yet algorithms on probably one of the most widely used social media platforms in the world isn't accounting for us. Now, again, I'm old enough to have been raised at a time that didn't include Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and LinkedIn. But for all the children who are being raised in this age, the ones who are playing those games when they're still in their formative years, they're interacting in a manner that says they're not important. The artificial intelligence isn't considering them. So somehow they're not part of humanity. There are so many other public apps that do the same thing. And we're often the default is either Caucasian or male. As a society, we have made extraordinary technical strides. We've cured illnesses. We've extended the life of the average man or woman. We've created these tiny little instruments that we carry around in our hands. They provide us with information on almost any subject that we could possibly think of. They link us in communication with almost anyone in the world. But as we continue to develop, as we continue to make these technological leaps, it's not sufficient if we don't take into account that first we should be problem solvers. And in that problem solving, we should take into account the whole of humanity. The developer, researcher, scientist, technologist, they're inventing. The social scientist is implementing. The public wants to be able to trust us. They want to be able to lean on an understanding that the work that's being done using artificial intelligence is for their good. That's taking them into account. That doesn't unnecessarily replace them, but is a benefit, an add-on, a plus. As the developer, researcher, scientist, technologist, social scientist does their work, we have to consider the impact. Are you doing good or are you doing bad? 
we shouldn't just do things because we can. We should do them because we can make the world better for it. I wanna thank you for having me. I wanted this to be more of a dialogue, a communication between us and I'm here to answer any questions as we really delve into how artificial intelligence is impacting our lives, especially around the issues of access, opportunity and inclusion. Thank you. Todd. Hello. And so um, we'll be taking questions from the chat and I got some private messages as well. Uh, but let me jump off, or actually one second, let me find this. Right, screen is for a minute. So Salika, which uh, industries do you think are more likely to be impacted by job displacement from AI? Again, as I mentioned, I'm in transportation. And very often as we talk about the automation of trucking and um, TNCs, instead of Uber having a person in the front seat, it'll be an autonomous vehicle. Um, I don't believe in that industry that we will wind up replacing humans as much as people believe that we will. Um, we have a deficit of professional drivers. We need them to drive our trucks to bring our goods um, to us. We need professional drivers to move buses. So, so all it'll be is an add-on in that community. We will have um, inroads in healthcare, in data management from artificial intelligence that will replace people in very many instances. But often what we see is rote work. Um, data entry, methodical, where we can allow citizens who are working in those fields to upskill and reskill to jobs that will provide them with a better quality of life. So I know labor is a big issue, but I think it's a red herring and I think people use it <clears throat> to dissuade those in the industry from moving forward. We can move forward in a manner that provides people a little more dignity in the jobs that they have and a better way of taking care of themselves. I don't think there's one industry that I would say is going to be completely decimated from it uh, because I think there are just too many opportunities out there when it comes to jobs. Anybody else? Hey, Salika, sorry. I don't know if you uh, heard me, but I was uh, asking a question. Uh, what do you see is in the future of general AI? Listen, um, it's getting better and better, right? Um, general AI is, there's the constant learning. Of course, my dog chooses to make noise now. Um, the machine to be as smart as a human there are things that we do that are so, um, we do them almost effortlessly and they require um, a unique set of skills to be used all at the same time, all in you know, fractions of a second. It's one of the reasons why in automation, um, if we're really being honest, will we ever get to, to this level five where a vehicle can travel anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances? Because what we do as humans when we drive a car, these instinctual actions that do avoid crashes, that do keep us safely on the roadway, are almost impossible to mimic through artificial intelligence. So what we know can be done is in geofence spaces, in, again, this sort of rote methodical routes that autonomy works well, and getting to level three and level four is more than attainable. But that level five, that that complete substitution under any circumstances is something that I don't believe we will see in, in our lifetime. So I'm, I'm not worried about that at this juncture. 
Um, I see a question from Richard about actors that are advocating for ethical or responsible AI. Um, there are some. At the end of the day, it's a business where people are developing and they're making these technical strides. And we do have a variety of companies who may put ESG high on their list of concerns. But all too often, those who are making the most money and who are the greatest actors um, in, in society don't include this environmental, you know, societal governance um, as being pivotal to their business um, enterprise. And so today we see more individuals. We see people who've been at companies, leave companies, or be pushed out of companies who are carrying the mantle about um, the ethical considerations that we should have. In other countries, um, especially in Europe, there is a greater emphasis on the responsibility of some of these companies. Um, how are they collecting data? Where is the data being stored? Who has access to the data? Those are all critical points that I don't think that we have enough emphasis here. Although the general public seems to almost um, instinctively feel that there's something they should be concerned about. They may not understand the specifics of it, but it doesn't all quite feel right to them. Those people who are advocating in this area, individuals who are doing it, once they interact more with the public and the public understands um, the needs for protections, I think then more and more companies will put this front and center in the work that they are doing. There's a question, um, that may not be going in order because we see a lot. How can we create diversity and inclusion in the AI um, talent development? What recommendations uh, do you have? Um, what I will say is, um, I just finished a call earlier today, somebody talking about creating the pipeline. The pipeline exists. There are communities, uh, universities out there where uh, technical degrees are a many graduating every year. I, I, I didn't go to Car North Carolina a and but I always talk about that school because they produce the largest number of black and brown engineers in the country every single year. They exist. If there's a job um, that's coming up and you're aware of, perhaps we don't ask our friend. Perhaps we don't um, circulate it within our personal community. Maybe we start posting these positions. Maybe we start letting people know that these opportunities exist. Um, we, we, we collaborate with universities. We create internships so that you can see the level of work that is capable from a variety of communities. But, but the talent exists. And the sooner we incorporate that talent into our um, developing and, and testing and implementing and even governance spaces, the better off we will be. Um, Human-centric applications of AI. Um, I don't know that my AI has to be human. I, the, what do I want the intelligence for? Do I want the intelligence to, for the sake of replacing a human being? Or do I want the intelligence to assist with a problem that we have in society? And in order to solve that problem, it requires artificial intelligence to get it done. So I'm not looking to remove people. I'm looking at how to make processes more efficient, especially in places, as I said, where the labor required by humanity doesn't provide them the opportunity to have a fruitful life. In those instances, I'm happy to replace you. I'm happy not to create these jobs that are miserable and don't afford you the ability to feed your family. But if we're just looking to replace humanity for humanity's sake, that is not problem solving. Um, Dave, I'm gonna read your question. It says, when do we see AI replacing large volume of jobs in the mobility space? What should we do about that? Should we do anything? And it is it an inevitable situation? 
Um, others have literally caused uh, such situations with algorithms deployed at scale. So it's very interesting when we look at mobility. Um, there is a fear that um, you know, autonomous vehicles will completely replace human beings. And um, I'll use New York City as for instance, where AI, you know, these autonomous vehicles are coming and coming and the Taxi and Limousine Commission is pushing back and they found that um, they don't have to be fearful of TNCs. Um, the, the TLC can continue to operate. These um, network controlled um, app generated mobility um, companies can work in tandem with the existing Taxi and Limousine Commission. And it, we've seen that even for the network controlled mobility providers, it's not a panacea, not making money. In an age today where our fuel prices are through the roof, it's hard for them to move the needle on prices because as, as community, we've gotten so accustomed to paying what we're paying and we wanna push back at any increases yet the drivers aren't making money. They aren't making money. Do we want bodies to stay where bodies can't be successful? Or would, is that the better space that AI can move into? And in places, as I said, where you could have a human touch and a human presence, especially in healthcare, I don't need a robot to take that space. A person can still give me that human touch by my bedside while maybe the AI is developing and creating faster ways to diagnose what's wrong with me and, and provide the cure. Should you increase regulation for responsible AI? Well, I think, you know, I'm not sure if this, Todd mentioned this at the beginning of the introduction for me. I'm a lawyer by training. For 18 years, I practiced as a product liability defense attorney. Um, you know, if, if we don't regulate it, if we don't get our hands around it and, and really grip onto the ever increasing artificial intelligence, then absolutely the legal community and the courts will do it for you. Because when harm is done and it was foreseeable or should have been foreseeable, when we've created devices and we've embedded artificial intelligence that then eventually harms people, uh, the law will hold you responsible. They may not hold you criminally responsible, but if it is a defect in design or a defect in manufacturing and there is provable harm, you bet some court is eventually going to force the issues of regulation concerning and involving artificial intelligence. And before we even get there, if we turn to European models, they're way ahead of us on this. Will the US be able to maintain its leadership is a question that I got. Um, I don't, are we leading? Um, I don't want the guinea pig model. And in other countries around the world where um, humans don't have as much autonomy or the government is more author authoritarian, um, they're operating in some ways on the guinea pig model. You're trying it out in humanity and society and they're seeing what works and doesn't work. And there can be negative consequences as a result of that. But those are homogeneous societies that that happens to. So it isn't impacting you based on uh, your economic status, your racial or um, gender status, or your status as to whether or not you're differently abled. That's not impacting them in those spaces. We see stuff like that more here, where the decisions and choices we're making surrounding artificial intelligence, the people who are controlling and, and, and inventing, um, again, not because they don't care, but without a lived experience and without it being front and center, when they are developing, it gets lost. And only until it is now seeped out into the public, it's being utilized um, amongst others, do we then look at the impacts? So we need a social 
technical approach, not just technical, we need both. Do we have um, values modeling in, in businesses and corporations? Are we looking at the data set, sets? Are we looking at the humans who will be interacting with this artificial intelligence? Are we testing and validating what we believe will be the outcomes and who's verifying and evaluating that? Um, there've got to be ways um, and some people believe there are and they're implementing them to mathematically verify bias, to say this does or doesn't have bias built into it and how do we improve it for the benefit of society. We need good governance models. It can't be again an after the fact. Side-by-side -side partnering as things are being developed and tested and rolled out, what's your governance strategy? Um, the data that we use to train AI, is the data factual? Are there biases built in? Um, one of the things I've talked about frequently as a result of COVID, when we look at our transportation systems, we had modeling that determined um, we're gonna stop certain movement on transportation lines based on um, people staying at home. And as social scientists and urban planners and, and government regulators started to look at what we call peak travel, we've now understood, those of us have understood it longer who lived it, that this notion of peak travel times on public transportation is a fallacy. That is predominantly sort of the white collar worker going into an office travel times. And that the travel times of the essential worker is in a nine to five thing. The essential worker, the, the nurse who is working an overnight shift, the um, garbage collector who has to be at the depot at three or four o'clock in the morning. The people who are the backbone of our community, law enforcement, um, first responders, they're not on a nine to five. The models and data that we are using to influence the decisions that we are making, to influence the technology that we're developing, without good data sets, we are again, baking into, into these systems further bias and making it even more difficult on people and humanity to move around. So we need to see where our data is coming from. And again, that requires more people in the room, a diversity of thought, a diversity of circumstance. If you look around the table, and this goes in any community, if you look around the table and everybody around the table looks like you and probably comes from a similar community that you do, how are you gonna get a diversity of thought? And that diversity of thought is good for business. How can the everyday person take control, or at least be more aware of the everyday use of AI in their lives? It's a good question because AI is in almost everything we do. Um, we need to start holding companies accountable. We need to start asking the questions about their data, about where the information is coming from. We need to challenge who's in the room when those decisions are being made. Um, it, is, it is hard as an individual to push back on some of these things. This is why associations are so important. It's a collective voice to push back at industry and appropriate stakeholders and also to challenge the government to properly regulate and have good oversight so that we're taking all of humanity into account when we make these kinds of decisions that can impact people's lives, not just from a positive space, but also possibly from a negative space as well. Todd, I think I'm uh, running up against uh, your clock and I wanna be mindful of your time. Yeah, how about we, uh ask one more question and then we'll go to, um, and then uh, that'll be it. Okay, is there a particular question you want me to answer? I guess let's talk about uh, Steven's question about the responsible AI in the metaverse. Is, there, is this gonna be a bigger challenge? Yeah, 
It will be. Um, again, who's in the room when the decisions are being made? Um, who, what businesses impact the decisions? And, and without a, um, you know, I often talk about the sort of political economy and the political will. Political will is often um, stimulated by the push, this swell of public sentiment. And so if you can get public sentiment, the, the, the grassroots, the, the rising up of the everyday citizen to say, wait a second here, what's going on? How is this being built? Where is this information coming from? That often impacts the political trajectory. That often impacts decisions that are being made both in the boardroom and at the government level and improves lives in general for all of us. Um, we wanna be mindful that, um, and it's certainly, you know, government can't turn on a dime. Business is a little bit more nimble and, and you don't want to, um, to be in a position of, um, of negatively impacting or impeding um, the march of innovation. You just wanna make sure that the innovation is problem solving for real problems. And then of course, taking into account um, the whole of humanity and not just very tiny subsections. Fantastic. Well, Talika, thank you so much for giving us such an inspiring uh, keynote and obviously answering all of our uh, audience's questions. Um, but right now we're going to go off screen for about two minute break. Um, and uh, then we'll get into the fireside chat. So thank you again, Salika. And um, if anyone would like to reach out to Salika, we're going to drop her LinkedIn uh, in the chat. And I hope that you get to reach out to her and uh, hopefully we get to work together uh, very soon. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.